A star detonated as a supernova. Twice. Trump chooses his new NASA administrator. Why deflecting asteroids is much more complex than we thought. And on Space Bites Plus, how your flight home could signal an alien civilization. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. This is an incredible image of a supernova remnant. There are many examples of supernova remnants. One example, of course, is the Crab Nebula, but there are others. And there are different kinds of supernovae, right? There are the type 2 supernovae, which are imploding massive stars. And there's the type 1a supernova, which is when a white dwarf is siphoning off material from a companion star. It reaches this very specific limit called the Chandrasekhar limit, and then it detonates. But astronomers have noticed examples where stars seem to have exploded with less than that Chandrasekhar limit. And this is a bit of a mystery. There's too many of these. And this supernova remnant is the remains of one of these objects. It's located in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is about 160,000 light years away. This is considered a subclass of the Type 1a supernova. It is a Type 1a supernova E. What is fascinating about this object is that it seems to have exploded twice. So what astronomers think happened is that the white dwarf was pulling off material from some companion star. And this built up a helium envelope around the outside of the white dwarf. This reached a critical amount of mass and this exploded from the surface of the white dwarf. This sent shockwaves both in and out of the white dwarf. The shockwaves that went into the white dwarf caused it to be higher pressure and that triggered the detonation from inside the white dwarf as well. And so it exploded on the outside, it exploded on the inside, and then you got this expanding cloud of wreckage. And the smoking gun is that there are these two lines of calcium, which are generated in this kind of supernova event. And astronomers were able to take this picture with the very large telescope. And it just shows you that the universe can do things much more complicated than we ever thought. And if you want to learn more, there's a story from Evan Goff on Universe Today. And then our next story is about how a rogue planet was hiding in Hubble Space Telescope data for over 25 years. So what happened was astronomers were using a telescope called Ogle, which is designed to find microlensing events. This is where you have one star or planet passing in front of another star and you get this flare and you calculate the time that this gravitational microlens happens and that tells you a lot of information about the object that passed in front. So astronomers detected this microlensing event and they realized that if you follow the trajectory of this object, then it should be in an older image, a region that was captured by the Hubble Space Telescope. So they went back to this old archival data that had been taken 25 years ago, and they were hoping to see the star that was causing this microlensing event. But when they looked, they couldn't see anything. And so whatever this object was, it wasn't star sized, it had to be planet sized either between kind of Earth and Saturn sized as it passed in front of this star. And it just shows how much information is there and available in archival data. And this story is by Mark Thompson. In 2022, NASA's DART mission slammed into asteroid Dimorphos. And this demonstrated, this avenged the dinosaurs. It demonstrated that humanity can reach out and we can shift the orbit of an asteroid. Now, in the case of Dimorphos, it was never a dangerous asteroid, and this just changed the length of its orbit, but it showed what we can do if we put our minds to it. But astronomers observed the flow of debris coming from the impact site with a small Italian cube site that was coming along for the ride, and this spacecraft detected that there was a stream of boulders, about 100 boulders, flying off of Dimorphos, but that they were clumped into two large groups. And astronomers performed a bunch of simulations and realized that these were boulders that were smashed by the solar panels on either side of the DART mission 
as it crashed into Dimorphos. These boulders were shattered, the debris went out in two different directions, and these boulders also contributed to the change in the asteroid's direction. And what this shows us is that it is just not clean, that when you are slamming into a pile of rubble, that there's going to be a lot of unknown forces involved and things aren't going to work exactly as you predict. And so it just shows that we have to do more tests. We have to smash more asteroids. We have to learn how this process works so that when we do detect a dangerous asteroid, we'll have much better control over it. If you want to learn more, it's a great story by Evan Goff. The search continues for dark matter. What is it? We don't know. But it's thought that dark matter, whatever it is, if it's a some kind of massive particle, it should be found concentrated in places that have higher density, places like the center of the Milky Way. And that as you have lots of dark matter that's interacting with each other, although it probably doesn't collide with itself or collide with regular matter, the gravitational interactions should occasionally drive it down into massive objects like stars, planets, brown dwarfs. And once this dark matter is accumulated into a very dense region inside, say, a brown dwarf, then it will inevitably start to self annihilate. The dark matter will crash into itself and it will generate heat. And that radiation will contribute to the heat that is given off by, say, a brown dwarf. And so in a new paper, astronomers proposed that you could search for brown dwarfs near the center of the Milky Way, and they will be warmer than the brown dwarfs that are farther away from the Milky Way. And that difference in the warmth is coming from dark matter that is accumulated inside these brown dwarfs. And if you want to learn more, there's a story by Evan Goff. A couple of weeks ago, we learned that the White House was withdrawing its recommendation for Jared Isaacman. And later on, President Trump said that the main reason for this was that you didn't want somebody who was a good friend with Elon Musk to be running NASA. And so now we've got a new name for the temporary administrator of NASA, and that is Sean Duffy. Now, if that name sounds familiar, Sean Duffy is currently the transportation minister. He's currently responsible for 10 different federal administrations within the Department of Transportation, like the FAA and the Department of Highways. And so this adds one additional set of responsibilities to his portfolio. Sean Duffy doesn't have any experience with NASA or space exploration, but he's a former Fox business host, and he was a Republican in Congress from 2011 to 2019. Now, we don't know what the implications are going to be for Janet Petra, who is currently the acting administrator for NASA. So once he fully takes on this role, I uh, will keep you posted. And then in addition to the new acting administrator, we are learning that the administration is proceeding with decreasing the headcount, the number of people who work at NASA. And so the first round is that they are offering early retirement buyouts to various senior people. Reporting from Politico says that over 2,100 very senior people across different NASA space flight centers have taken the buyout. And these are people with designations of GS-13 to GS-15, which is the most senior people, people with plenty of experience, plenty of domain experience in spaceflight. And so you're seeing a lot of early retirements from people who are responsible for the human missions to the moon, as well as other science operations and science missions. Apparently, this is about half the personnel that the administration is hoping will leave NASA in this first round of cuts, which ends on July 25th. And then we will see as those further budget cuts take over, and that has further implications as well. So this is sort of the beginning of these cuts in employees that we've seen happen to other agencies is now fully starting to happen within NASA. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best space news story of the week. And the winner last week was the discovery of the third interstellar object. So thank you everybody who voted. We will post this week's vote over onto the post tab here on our YouTube channel. So just while you're scrolling, give it a vote. Of course, the best chance, subscribe to the channel, click on the notifications bell, Train the algorithm and be trained by the algorithm. What could go wrong? Vote, 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 vote. So one of the most fascinating objects in the outer solar system is this world called Quawar, and it is a dwarf planet. It's about 42 astronomical units away, which puts it in between the orbits of Neptune and Pluto. And it's a 
just a little over 500 kilometers across, but it is squashed a little bit and rapidly rotating. But what makes it really weird is that it has two rings around it. And those rings are too far away. There's some kind of mystery here that's going on. So you've probably heard of this idea of the Roche limit. So when an object gets too close to a more massive object, like say if an asteroid gets too close to the Earth, then the tidal forces, essentially the force pulling on the near side of this object are stronger than the far side of the object where it can no longer hold itself together and that will tear it apart. And so every massive object has this Roche limit that if anything gets too close, it gets torn apart. With Quaur, the rings are outside of the Roche limit. And so how could they be a torn up object if that object never got close enough to be torn up? And the clue seems to be that it has a moon that is orbiting kind of like a shepherd. And so we got some really cool new observations from James Webb, where they were able to observe Qualwar as it was passing in front of a star. This is a stellar occultation, very useful tool in astronomy, allows you to measure changes in brightness on the star as the object and its rings are passing in front. And so James Webb used for a stellar occultation to learn more about Qualwar. We've got a story by Andy Thomas Wick. And now we're going to wrap up this week's episode with a bunch of really cool images and video. So first up, we've got some comparison images between the Hubble Space Telescope and James Webb, where they're looking at the same object. In this case, they're looking at open star clusters located inside the small Magellanic cloud. And so in the Hubble Space Telescope version, you get the visible light, you're seeing the light that is coming from the stars, as well as the gas and dust that is glowing very brightly in between those stars. In the James Webb version, you're seeing it in the infrared, which can see through the gas and the dust and see the places where newly forming stars are. And so you can just look at this comparison between the two and just give a much better sense of what James Webb is capable of compared to what Hubble does. They're both incredibly useful observatories. They just focus on different wavelengths of light. And if you want to learn more and see all of the comparison images, We've got a story by Evan Goff. All right, this is cool. This is an image of a red Sprite that was taken by the astronaut Nicole Ayers on board the International Space Station. And these red sprites for a long time, they were very theoretical, people weren't sure this was a thing that was actually happening. But now there is plenty of evidence that these do happen. And they're caused by electrical activity in a thunderstorm where you've got electrical discharges going up into higher levels of the atmosphere, and then the electrical discharges are causing nitrogen to glow red. And so you get this red Sprite. What's really incredible about this image is that it's really tough to take a picture from the International Space Station. And so about a year ago, Don Pettit, when he was an astronaut, he set up a special camera rig that allowed him to take long exposure images from the International Space Station. And so then Nicole learned a bunch of his techniques as well as brought techniques of her own was able to know which kind of thunderstorm was probably going to be producing red sprites. And then she was there to take a whole bunch of pictures and get the ones that mattered. And there's a great conversation on Twitter between Don Pettit and Nicole about this picture, but it's just it's phenomenal. And finally, here is a time lapse image of 3i Atlas, which is that third interstellar object. And this image was taken by the Very Large Telescope, which is one of the largest telescopes on Earth. And this is a great example of how astronomers measure the orbits of objects. And so this is a series of images that were taken over 13 minutes a whole bunch of separate exposures. And then they wrap up the end of this video with a long exposure that shows you what the whole thing looks like. And it's pretty tough to see. But you can see this sort of central part, and then more of a dusty coma around the center of the comet. And again, this is really exciting, because we are seeing this object inbound, currently out around the orbit of Jupiter, it's going to make a close pass by Mars, and eventually it will get within about one and a half astronomical units of the sun, and it should get increased activity. So we will continue to watch this 
all the way through probably until the end of the year. So stay tuned for more information. Was that enough space news stories? Do you want more? Well, good news. I am currently writing my weekly email newsletter. This is where I compile all of the space news stories that we're covering on Universe Today just this week. And it is many times more than what you see here on Space Bites. For example, we've got a story about how a planet was so close to its star that it was causing flares that were ruining the planet. Total cell phone. We've got a story by Evan Goff. And then a story about how we can get more sensitivity about current gravitational wave detectors by changing the angle of the mirrors. And then we've got a story about how international researchers are coming together to assist with the upcoming Chinese Mars sample return mission, which if all goes well, should be launching in 2028 and bring back the first ever chunk of Mars by 2031. And we've got a story by Matt Williams. So if those additional stories are interesting to you, then you should definitely subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday. It's completely free. There's no ads. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. But if you do want one more story here in Space Bites. We've got a longer version that we post over on Patreon called Space Bites Plus. It's exactly the same video except with one additional story, but it's completely free and there's no ads in it. You're going to have to watch ads here on YouTube. It's the same video over there, but with no ads. And this week's bonus story is all about how if you're flying in an airplane, you might be signaling aliens to the location of Earth. I'll put a link in the show notes. So you can watch that version of this episode. All right, I'm going to talk about a gigantic question show that we just released. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, Bailey Griffin, Brian Bodie, Caribou, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Cy Nelson, David Gilton, David Matz, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Marcel Smiths, Michael Purcell, Modso, Paul Robach, Rank Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fowler Munley, Vlad Shipplin, and Wolken Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. So we just wrapped up a marathon recording of the patrons question show, which is the thing that we do every month on our patron channel. And so around the 15th of the month, I put up the call to all of the patrons. And then we get dozens close to 100 questions that come in. And then my producer Anton and I will go through those questions and we answer them. And what's different from the regular question shows that you see here on the channel is that these are from the patrons. These are from the super enthusiasts about space exploration. And they often give me homework which will require some calculations or for me to go down a rabbit hole for me to look at. And so a lot of the questions that we get on the patrons question show are very different, very high level, but really fascinating questions. And I really enjoy both answering the questions as well as the work that we have to go into to be able to answer the questions. I and mean, good news, uh, Anton has a physics degree and so he can help double check everything that I say. And so I'll just give you an example of some of the questions. Like how far away would you be from two colliding black holes before before you started to feel the effect of the gravitational waves that first your eyesight would start to change. And then you would start to feel the forces in your body. And then at a certain point, you would literally start feeling pain. And then if you got closer, just the gravitational waves alone would be tearing your body apart. We got a lot of questions about the Fermi paradox, about Dyson spheres, about the Kardashev scale, but they're very nuanced questions and with people who, who have a really good understanding. And then there was a great question about how dark it is in deep space that you know would even the most sensitivized animals be able to to see their surroundings if they were far enough away from the Earth. So uh, the new patron only question show is available to it's audio. It's a podcast. And it goes out automatically into the patron only podcast feed. But if you want, you can go and you can check it out if you're a patron. Now I'm going to put out the call for the next patrons question show in about five days. So it, you can sort of have a one two thing. If you are interested in getting one of your questions answered, then go ahead, become a patron and then listen to all of the backlog of all of the patrons question shows. 